Next, the sound of supercars in West London in the summer might be familiar, but the extraordinary footage you are about to see won't be. It shows two cars speeding down a narrow residential street, the second ricocheting off almost every car it passes, leaving those who live there to deal with the aftermath, as Simon Harris reports. A McLaren, a Porsche and a Bentley safely parked for the night, but about to become worthless scrap. Watch the approaching headlights. First, one car races into Moore Street and then another. All it takes is a slight misjudgment. The Porsche is catapulted across the pavement. The Audi 4x4 responsible for the devastation flips over. Amazingly, the two men inside survive, although the driver has serious head injuries. He came out of the car. I was thinking he was dead, but he came out alive with blood all over his face. Did um, you say anything? He did, because I asked if he was OK, and he was okay, in total shock, but he just kept on saying, I was being chased, I was being chased. The street was quickly full of people, woken by the noise and barely able to believe what they were seeing. Ten parked cars were either wrecked or damaged. The owners of the McLaren, Porsche and Bentley reckoned theirs alone were worth almost half a million pounds. Apart from the driver and his passenger, the other person to have the luckiest of escapes was Violet Pemberton Piggott, who was doing the washing up in front of her basement window down there when one of the 4x4s smashed into these railings. One piece of iron railing pierced the glass just feet from where she was standing. I was uh, washing up downstairs and suddenly the whole of the front of the house seemed to be coming in on top of me. And I came up here and by that stage, every car in, in Wall Street seemed to be, have its alarm ringing. Complaints about supercars on the streets of Chelsea are nothing new. People have long been angered by a summer invasion of drivers, apparently eager to show off their fast and furious skills, or in this case, lack of them. Carol Feldman, who's disabled, relies on her car. After last night, it's almost certainly a write-off. It was an accident waiting to happen. We've had these boy racers coming down the road in the summer, um, and they, 2 o'clock in the morning, 12 o'clock at night, racing down the roads, no control, and the police have not been able to do anything. Kensington and Chelsea Council said this was the first crash it was aware of. Scotland Yard said no one had been arrested, but two people were taken to hospital, and the driver is still being treated. Simon Harris, ITV News, Knightsbridge. Good evening. They were youth players in the 1970s at one of the world's most famous football clubs. But what they imagined Chelsea Football Club to be like was far from the reality that some experienced. An independent review has found young boys were targeted and sexually abused for years by former Chief Scout Eddie Heath, described as prolific and manipulative. The report concluded some staff at the club must have known and simply turned a blind eye. Well, Chelsea has apologised unreservedly, but it's little consolation for Heath's victims, as our correspondent Simon Harris reports. A magnificent recovery leading to the London side's first cup win. For Chelsea's fans, the 1970s could hardly have started better. But behind the triumphs and the glory of an FA Cup win, this was a club hiding a dark and sinister secret. Eddie Heath, the club's youth coach, was a paedophile, preying on young players. Players like Gary Johnson, who began to be abused as a 13-year-old. This particular time I had a bad day at school and um, he came to my parents and said, look, you know, can I take him home for a little while to have a chat? And I'll bring him back, you know, later. We, as children, wanted two things, A, to play football, and B, to play for Chelsea Football Club. And Chelsea Football Club took that dream away. Two and a half years ago, Chelsea came under pressure to launch a formal investigation. 117 people gave evidence to the inquiry, among them some of Heath's victims. I was very intimidated. He was a very big man, said one. He was a powerful presence around the club. And another said of him, he was regarded as Nightmare Eddie. The investigation concluded Heath was a dangerous and prolific child abuser. His conduct was beyond reprehensible, said the club, but he got away with it. The report also points a finger of blame at former assistant coach Dario Grady, accusing him of missing a chance to stop Heath. 
Grady, who's now 78, hasn't responded to the findings. He's definitely not, not the only adult at that club who knew of his, of his staff. In a statement, Chelsea's directors said today the club apologises unreservedly for the terrible past experiences of some of our former players. Eddie Heath died more than 30 years ago, but Gary Johnson, now a cabbie, says the torment didn't end. I would get in the cab, go to work. I'm 100 yards down the road and I'm crying my eyes out. And I couldn't understand why I was crying my eyes out. I'd come back, miss a day, sometimes not get out of bed and miss another day, so on and so on. And it's been a pattern over the last 40 years plus. In a separate report today, the children's charity Bernardo's said young black players at Chelsea were racially abused in the 1980s and 1990s. Two shameful verdicts in one day, not the curtain raiser to the new season fans might have hoped for. Simon Harris, ITV News, Stamford Bridge. Good evening. As the search for missing teenager Nora Quarren enters the fifth night in Malaysia, police have now said they cannot rule out that she has been abducted. The 15-year-old was reported missing by her family on Sunday morning after she disappeared from the resort bedroom she was staying in. Today, detectives confirmed they had found fingerprints in the cottage that they were analysing, as our correspondent Simon Harris reports. The hunt for Nora Quarren is growing bigger by the day. More than 200 Malaysian police officers have joined the search for the London teenager. Teams with tracker dogs are trying to find any trace of her. The police have set up roadblocks. Nora's parents are convinced she was kidnapped on Saturday night. But yesterday, the police said there was no evidence of abduction. They were treating it as a missing person. We still classify this case is. Uh, this missing person, not an abduction. Fast forward 24 hours and today there was a different message from a different senior police officer. Although we treat this case as a miss, we classified this case as a missing person, but we are not ruling out any possibility. So what has changed? The police revealed they're examining fingerprints found in the house where Nora was staying with her family. From the very start, they will have had to have had half an eye on the fact that it might be a crime. And so while they're going in to try and look for clues as to where Nora might have gone, they also need to make sure that while they're doing that, they're preserving evidence for scientific or, or similar examination in the future. The family was staying in a cottage at a remote jungle retreat which markets itself as an eco-resort. It's a former rubber plantation with seven luxury holiday cottages and a cap on the number of people allowed to stay, no more than 20 adults at any one time. The compound is surrounded by dense woodland. Anyone venturing out alone could quickly get into trouble. It's very hot, it's very humid. This is a particularly hot time of year, so hydration is pretty important. Um, there, there doesn't seem to be, from what I know, any particularly dangerous wild animals. There aren't any tigers or anything like that there. Um, but the problem is getting lost. You know, some of that uh, vegetation is quite dense. Nora's parents say her learning difficulties make her vulnerable. She can't look after herself and won't understand what's going on. And they're certain she wouldn't have wandered off. Simon, in the last half an hour, we've actually heard from Nora's family. What have they said? Well, we can only imagine the agony that Nora's parents, uh, Maeve and Sebastian, are going through as they await news. They're said to be devastated, far too upset to talk publicly. But tonight, one of Nora's aunts has spoken at the hotel in Malaysia. We must remain hopeful. And we ask everyone to keep Nora in their thoughts and to continue to support the ongoing search for her. Nora is still missing and she is very vulnerable and we need to do everything we can to bring her home. While the police are happy to talk about the search for Nora, they're reluctant to say anything about the investigation. We don't know any more about those fingerprints. We do know, however, that Nora was asleep in an upstairs bedroom with her brother and sister. It was a downstairs window that was found open. Other than that, the police are keeping their cards close to their chest. All right, Simon, incredibly worrying for her family. Thank you. Good evening. Sudden and brutal is how the Metropolitan Police are describing a machete attack on one of its officers in Leighton last night. The policeman, who is 28 years old, was trying to stop a van which he suspected was being driven without insurance. Despite having been stabbed in the head and body by the van's driver, the officer managed to taser his attacker 
who has been arrested. The Prime Minister has praised the courage of the policeman who is now recovering in hospital, as Simon Harris reports. Police officers give first aid to a badly wounded colleague lying in the street. The injured PC has been attacked by a van driver wielding a machete. It was a very big. It was like a sword. Literally. It was about that big. Mona Laresh and Shabazz Chowdhury saw what happened from their window. Um, the guy turned around and he had the big sword type of thing in his hand and he went straight to the officer and hit him in the head, uh, thing head and the hand. Despite his injuries, the officer managed to fire his taser. He literally tasered him and then the guy got back up again so quickly. Yeah. So the female officer continued to taser him. I think they tasered him about twice. The high road in Leighton was quickly swamped with police officers, some visibly shocked by what happened to their colleague. They turned up and they started giving him the first aid and trying to stop bleeding and trying to you know, uh, make him conscious and speaking to him constantly. The van driver, seen here pinned to the ground, had been stopped because police suspected he had no insurance. The individual tried to get back in the car, the van and drive off, and the officer went to stop him because he had no insurance. Uh, and then that escalated very, very quickly to the individual arming himself uh, with a machete and attacking the PC. What this underscores for me is the bravery of our police, people who actually go towards danger to keep us safe, our sympathies obviously with the officer and, and, his, and his family. The injured PC needed stitches to a head wound and an operation on his hand. It's thought he used his hands to fend off the attack. He's expected to make a full recovery. Leighton is in the London borough of Waltham Forest, where since the start of 2019, there have been more than 3,000 violent crimes. Five people have been murdered here. I just think it's getting very scary now that the blaseness of it, that you are attacking a police officer. The police don't have as much backup as they used to. So, you know, and the youngsters got nothing to do, basically. I mean, it's holiday, where are they? There's been a lot of knife crimes around here anyway, and it is getting worse, you know? Something needs to be done, definitely. Tonight, a 56-year-old man is in custody, held on suspicion of causing grievous bodily harm.